In this video, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into the Marilyn Manson defamation case against Evan Rachel Wood and Ilma Gore. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC. And on this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. So if you are just getting into the Marilyn Manson defamation case, you might want to consider taking a look first at the first couple introductory videos that we have on this case on this channel, linked in the description below and also in the corner right here. But otherwise, if you are familiar with this particular case, in this video, what we're going to be doing is looking at one specific part of the complaint, focusing on one of the causes of action, particularly defamation per se. In other videos, we'll go through the other causes of action that he's alleged in this complaint. So if you are wanting a deep dive on intentional infliction of emotional distress, for example, that'll be in another video coming out very soon. So here's a quick roadmap for how this video is going to go down. First, we're going to take a look at defamation per se under California law. Next, we're going to go through the particular section of the complaint that talks about defamation and what Marilyn Manson's allegations really are. And third, we're going to go through the fact section where it goes a little bit more in detail about those factual allegations for what exactly it is that he's saying is defamatory. And then we'll apply it and wrap it all up together and... I'm going to want to know what you have to say about these particular claims, whether or not you think that they might have some merit, maybe not, maybe you need some more information to find out first. But before we get into those details, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of online classes and members across 150 countries who come together to find inspiration and take the next step in their creative journey. What I like about Skillshare is it's a relaxing way to unwind, invest in yourself, and learn something that you've maybe always wanted to learn but didn't exactly know where to begin. And across a broad spectrum of classes available, you can find something that will match your goals and interests. For example, I recently took fashion stylist and costume designer Veronica Lipatova's class on the history of colors. In that class, I learned things like why green became associated with banks and merchants, and why it was actually making many in the middle class very sick for a period of time. Anyway, it's all ad-free and there are new premium classes that are launched every week. And the entire catalog is now available in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. And the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So be sure to check that out below and thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Anyway, let's get into it. After I fix my lighting. <laughs> okay. Natural light is wonderful, except for when it's hitting you in the face. <laughs> okay, so what is defamation per se under California law? First off, defamation per se is outlined in California Civil Code section 46. There it says, slander is a false and unprivileged publication orally uttered and also communications by radio or any mechanical or other means which, one, charges any person with crime or having been indicted, convicted, or punished for crime, Two, imputes in him the present existence of an infectious, contagious, or loathsome disease. Three, tends directly to injure him in respect to his office, profession, trade, or business, either by imputing to him general disqualification by those respects which the office or other occupation peculiarly requires, or by imputing something with reference to his office, profession, trade, or business that has a natural tendency to lessen its profits, Four, imputes to him impotence or want of chastity. Or five, which by natural consequence causes actual damage. So in other words, defamation per se falls under four different categories. First is a statement that seems to impute some kind of a criminal activity. Second is where the statement claims that the individual has some sort of a an infectious disease. Third is where it is somehow imputes their profession or their office or their trade or business in a peculiar kind of way. Or fourth is where it basically says that somebody is either impotent or particularly sleazy. Otherwise, if a defamatory statement doesn't fit into one of those first four categories, it gets bumped down into that fifth category, which is all other statements that cause some kind of actual damage. So all of this basically means that defamation on its own comes down to four main elements. First, the defendant makes an untrue statement about the plaintiff. 
Second, they make that statement to a third party, at least one third party. Third, under Supreme Court precedent, because we are talking about a case that is brought by a public figure, they have to have done so with actual malice. And finally, the damages element. In other words, defendant's statement about the plaintiff caused plaintiff harm to their reputation, and that caused actual damages. And with California Civil Code Section 46, if it fits into one of those four categories, then that last piece, that damages piece, doesn't actually have to be met, just like what we saw in the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard defamation trial. And as a reminder, if you are a regular viewer of this channel and you have been watching over the last few months, you know from the Depp v. Heard trial that actual malice means where the defendant has lied about the plaintiff, not just with mere negligence, but where they, where they knew that what they were saying was false or that they were being reckless as to the truth or falsity of the statement. Okay, so let's take a look at the complaint itself to see what exactly Marilyn Manson or Brian Warner, as he is legally known, is alleging as to defamation per se. According to the complaint, Brian Warner says that Ilma Gore stated to persons other than Warner that during the filming of Groupie, the actress in the video was a minor and that the actress was dead. Gore understood the statements to refer to Warner and specifically to mean that Warner's role in the making of Groupie, e.g. as a child prawn, was criminal. Indeed, she stated that Groupie was evidence of a felony and that Warner would be indicted as a result. Those statements about Groupie were false. The actress in the video, Paula Weiss, is alive. She was not a minor when Groupie was filmed. She has since publicly stated that she was not a minor at any time during the production of the film. In addition, the director of the film, Joseph Coltis, has publicly stated that these claims are all fake. On information and belief, Gore knew the statements were false or had serious doubts as to their truth. Upon information and belief, Gore knew the actress was not a minor or had serious doubts that she was a minor, but instead intended to peddle these false and defamatory statements because they would validate and enhance her fabricated narrative regarding Warner's alleged abuse of others, including as reflected on the checklist provided to women that Gore recruited to come out against Warner. Gore made the above described false and defamatory statements without privilege or justification. The above described false and defamatory statements injured Warner by diminishing his reputation in his profession, trade, and or business, which has a natural tendency to lessen his profits. It was Gore's intent and expectation that the defamatory statements would injure Warner economically, including by lessening his profits. The above described false and defamatory statements also injured Warner by causing him to experience harm that is compensable by general damages. Gore's intent and expectation was that the defamatory statements would cause Warner this harm. Warner did not discover and had no reason to discover what prospect of accusers had been told in confidential discussions with Gore until one such person revealed in at least November 2021 that Gore had made these statements. Gore also acted with oppression, fraud, or malice as defined by California Civil Code Section 3294 and engaged in highly reprehensible conduct warranting punitive damages. So California Civil Code Section 3294 is the punitive damages statute in California law. So by referring to it and alleging these kinds of harms, he is also invoking the ability to get punitive damages potentially from, at the very least, Ilma Gore in this particular lawsuit. So we're about to turn to the factual allegation section of this particular complaint, particularly where he talks about this groupie allegations. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. But before we do that, I do want to point out two things that I noticed reading through these particular paragraphs. First, he did allege a criminal element to the defamatory statements, the allegedly defamatory statements. <laughs> oh, jeez, cat. And second, he does allege that there is a an element that is diminishing his reputation in his profession, trade, or business. So as far as this complaint has alleged, it looks like we are in defamation per se territory. Now, let's turn to the factual allegation section to see if there is more detail that he alleges here having to do with his defamation per se claims, in particular having to do with the groupie video. Looking at page 17 of the complaint, Warner goes into detail here. He cites it as section F of his factual allegations called Gore Slanders Warner. Here the complaint reads, between 2019 and 2021, as part of her multi-pronged attack on Warner, Gore had multiple conversations with prospective accusers in which she claimed that a 1996 short film made by Warner called Groupie depicted child abuse and child prawn. 
During one such conversation in 2021, Gore said that the actress in Groupie was a minor at the time of the shoot and was dead, and that if the video were to be seen, Warner would be indicted. Gore's statements about Warner and Groupie are demonstrably false. Gore knew they were false or acted with reckless disregard of their falsity. The actress, Paula Weiss, was 22 years old at the time the film was made. She has publicly stated that she was not a minor, was involved in conceptualizing the plot of the film, and was acting and hamming it up. Clips from Groupie were featured in a 1998 tour documentary called Dead to the World. Weiss not only was thanked in the credits to that film, but also went on to star in music videos, including Manson's Long Hard Road Out of Hell in 1997 and Garbage's Push It in 1998. The director of Groupie and Dead to the World, Joseph Cultus, has publicly stated that Gore's claims are all fake. Still, promulgating these and other falsehoods was part of Gore's scheme to orchestrate and amplify false accusations against Warner, thereby bolstering Wood's claim that Warner had been her and others' abuser. This, in turn, would bring further attention to the Phoenix Act, the Associated Film Project, and curry favor with Wood and potential and existing accusers against Warner. Indeed, Gore's defamatory allegations regarding Groupie have been repeated in at least one civil complaint filed against Warner and consequently have reverberated through the press. This is entirely unsurprising, given that Gore discussed these false allegations with prospective accusers. Wood condoned and encouraged Gore to promulgate defamatory falsehoods about Warner in order to further their conspiracy. So looking at these portions of the complaint, it looks like the defamation per se cause of action is not so much against Evan Rachel Wood, although it does allege that she condoned and encouraged. So maybe there's some sort of vicarious liability bent that he's trying to go for here. But chiefly, it looks like the allegations for this particular cause of action are against Ilma Gore almost exclusively. There are a lot of facts that have been alleged in this particular case. We're talking about fraudulent FBI letters. We're talking about swatting. We're talking about hacking into computers and emails and social media accounts. And there's a lot that's going on in this particular case. But as it regards the defamation piece, it seems like it's actually relatively simple. It's just having to do with the groupie video. It's not having to do with any kind of allegations about DV claims against, uh, sorry, excuse me, against Marilyn Manson or Brian Warner in particular. And so that seems to be one material difference between this case and the Depp v. Heard case. And it could have to do with the fact that anti-slap laws are very strong in California. I'm not going to get into too much detail about anti-slap in this particular video because I'm going to dedicate an entire video to the anti-slap motions that have been filed by Evan Rachel Wood and by Ilma Gore because they deserve their own video entirely. But basically, if you're not familiar with anti-slap, SLAP is S-L-A-P-P, -P, and it stands for Strategic Litigation Against Public Participation. It basically is a way for a defendant to remove a lawsuit filed against them that is improperly trying to, one in one way or another, impede their First Amendment right to speak or to petition the government or something along those lines pretty much a First Amendment defense and a very strong one in California, as opposed to what we saw in Depp v. Heard in Virginia. So I'll get into more detail later on that. So because this allegation of defamation falls into arguably two of the four categories under California Civil Code Section 46, this probably does fall into defamation per se. And that means that the defamation elements that Warner arguably has to meet is actually three rather than four. So let's go into those three elements to see if he has alleged them for the purposes of a complaint. First, he has to show that the defendant made an untrue statement about the plaintiff. In this particular case, it looks like the untrue statement that he alleges was made was by Ilma Gore, and it had to do with the groupie video, whether or not the individual that was involved in the video was a minor and whether or not they were alive. So as it relates to this first element, it does look like there is a statement that was made that is alleged to have been untrue. That's at least what Manson says in the complaint. Whether or not that statement was made or whether or not it was true or untrue are things that will be proved or disproved on the evidence. But at this particular stage, that's not really what he needs to show in order for this complaint to survive. All he has to do is make the allegation and assert facts behind it. 
Second, he does allege that it was made to third parties. He says specifically that the statement was made to people other than Warner. He doesn't specify exactly who she told necessarily, but he does say that it was people other than him. That is enough to satisfy the element, and it's enough to probably survive a motion to dismiss, or in California, as it's called, a demur. And third is the actual malice piece. In other words, he has to allege that Ilma Gore has made the statement either knowing that what she said was false or that she was being reckless as to the truth or falsity of the statement when she made it. And he does, in fact, allege that Gore knew that she was not a minor or had serious doubts that she was a minor, but instead intended to peddle these false and defamatory statements because they would validate and enhance her fabricated narrative. So, in other words, he has alleged it and alleging it in the complaint, as I said before, is enough. So as for the defamation piece, I am going to be very curious to see what exactly it is that Ilma Gore says in her anti-slap motion, because it might have to do with defamation or it might have to do with some of the other allegations in this particular complaint. But if the anti-slap motion has to do with the defamation piece, I'm very curious to hear what exactly it is that she is arguing. And as this case develops, I'm very curious to see what the evidence shows for this particular case. Who exactly did she make the statements to and where, what, was the, what was the context of those conversations? But what do you think? Do you suspect that this is maybe true, maybe not true? Are you waiting on more evidence to come to light? Let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it informative. And if you did, I would love it if you'd hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next video.